Okay, one of the rules that we have is that I'm not supposed to say anything on this tape that dates it because, you know, it could, runs for several semesters. But I don't care. Three days ago from the time this tape was taped, my son won an Emmy Award for music editing. I want everybody to know that semester after semester. I may never make another tape just so this announcement stays on forever. <laughs> all right, so that's, that's all that counts. I did my job in life and I told them, send it to me, I paid for your music education. But anyway, okay, now that we have that out of the way, um, let's go to the PowerPoint, uh, if we could. If you remember, last time we ended with the, this thing about test-taking abilities. We pointed out these seven things. And I told you there's one more. And uh, come back to me. And the other problem, it's, it's not really an assumption made by IQ tests. You, as, right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. As you can see, most of the assumptions do not hold water. We know that age, whoops, sorry that age is not a criterion for measuring development. There are normal variations in age. And kids who know more answers when they're six, know more, kid A knows more than kid B, and see if you can get my picture in the corner, okay? By the time they're 16, there's no difference. And certainly by the time they're 56, there's no difference, or 36. People do not have a standard environment. There is no way, there is no way that we can separate out how many of the answers in the IQ test are learned from something innate, whatever that is, and how much of it is due to what's learned. Once again, we're going to see many theories that say that performance is not a sufficient measure. We have to know how people got, got the answer. Um, come back to me for a second. One of the articles that you were assigned to read makes it very clear that good curriculum, even with underachieving kids, gets results and you don't have to know the numbers. Okay, the other thing, let's go back to five, measures that the measures are sufficiently complete. Okay, we know, come back to me for a second, there are many, come back to me if you can, there are many, many areas that the IQ test does not test. Music ability, artistic ability, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to ask yourself a question. Each person with all the various things the person knows and doesn't know and how the person functions, what the person does, what the person prefers and per people's abilities to do things and not to do things and, and how they do them. Can that all be boiled down to one number? And since these tests came out, the answer has, for many people has been no. You have to test various areas if you're going to test. Okay, and remember we talked, we, we talked about all the subtests measuring the same underlying ability. If they don't, there's no way you can take a mean and a standard deviation, and most people don't see how they do. How one point on whether you can put the puzzle together right is the same as one point about, you know, this trivial pursuit game, what's the distance from Peoria to, uh, you know, to Pocatello, uh, is, which is another which is making designs, which what's missing from this picture, you know. It's very difficult, okay? And finally, we know that test-taking abilities are not equal. I told you, didn't I tell you about being a mechanic in the Israeli Air Force? I told you about that. Okay. Now, there's one other thing that I want to say, and that this is not actually an assumption, but a problem with these tests, and it has to be just kind of the whole question of, of, these, of IQ and ethnicity. Okay. For a long, long time, <clears throat> people who, these IQ tests, People know that there's a history, certainly in a lot of times since 69, an article came out by a guy named Jensen showing how these IQ tests prove the innate intellectual inferiority of blacks. Okay? That's not the first time people try to pull that one. Okay? In the Army, in World War I, they had two tests of IQ at what they called an Alpha, an Army Alpha and Alpha, an Army Beta. There were slightly different tests, and the Army Alpha was for people who could read, and the Army Beta was for people who couldn't read. And first of all, it was pretty clear if you gave the, well, it doesn't matter. The Beta was weighted to show people that they were, that these people were not too clever. And the Army Beta test was initially used, the Army test was initially used, particularly at that time, most of the blacks in America lived in the South, and they were deprived of educational opportunities. You can see how being deprived of educational opportunities is going to make your IQ go down. It's obvious, since there's so much on the test that measures school-type achievement. And so that they found, and they began to trumpet that these tests showed the innate inferiority of blacks. Unfortunately for them, and fortunately for us for a while, um, 
poor Southern, if you took Southern whites from the same economic strata, poor rural Southern whites, they had the same IQs. So nobody wanted to say that they were not the superior, so they shut up for a while. But since 69, attempts have been made to do this. Let me tell you, however, that this is not the first time, okay? These tests have been used to show the innate inferiority, quote unquote, of just about every ethnic group that has, just about every ethnic group that people didn't like too well. Just about every immigrant ethnic group. The only one who really haven't been attacked by these tests are the Irish, because they got here before the test. Okay? And throughout America, what has basically happened is that there have been, as new ethnic groups have come, there's been tremendous opportunity, often confronted with side by side with tremendous prejudice. And inside of academia itself, there were people who sided with one side and sided with the other side. Okay? The whole notion of race, for instance, which is scientific, I have to excuse me, just very weak notion, was cooked up by people who wanted to show the innate superiority of the white race. So maybe we'll get to that in a second. So this happens. So for instance, does anybody, when the IRA, the first immigration that really found a tremendous amount of prejudice against it, en masse, en masse, was the Irish. What was wrong with the Irish? What didn't people like about the Irish? They came in the latter half of the 19th century. Well, they came in the eight, the middle of the 19th century when the Irish began to come to build the railroads, etc. The potato famines in the 1840s, 50s, something like that. What, was, what caused prejudice against the Irish? What was wrong with them, in quotes? Why didn't them, there was something about them that rubbed it up against how Americans saw themselves. What? Say it. Push it down. Push it down. They were Catholics. They were Catholic. They talked English, but they were Catholic. We don't like Catholics. Millard Fillmore, who had been the President of the United States, ran on what was called the American Party. Most people call it the Know Nothing Party because they were really nuts. But he wanted to find an issue to unite North and South. It was being pulled apart by the slavery issue and other things. So he said, oh, I'm going to run on a hate the Catholics platform. That we can agree on. Fortunately, nobody voted for him. But Okay, there was tremendous, America saw itself as the bastion of Protestants. I believe even today there are more Protestants in the United States than any place else. But, okay, so that started it. Then, the next wave of immigration, which began coming in the 1880s through the 1920s, and IQ tests were around by then, certainly toward the middle of that immigration, okay, was, came from Southern and Eastern Europe. Okay, and they had a lot wrong with them. First of all, most of them also were not Protestants. Most of them were Catholics. If they weren't Catholics, they were Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or Jews. Right? Very right. We're talking about Poland, po people from Poland, Italy, Greece, Russia, the Russian Empire, right, which was included by Latvia and Latvia, Estonia, okay? So a lot of Catholics, Greek Orthodox, and there was something else wrong with them. They didn't talk English. And they got together in their local ethnic communities and talked their language. And, and again, you see the same thing, by the way, with the, with the immigration from Latin America now. They had radio stations in their own languages and papers in their own language. And they looked weird and they talked weird and they had funny religions and all kinds of stuff. Okay. In 1924, Congress passed legislation shutting down immigration for about 40 years. In the 60s, it was opened again. And the way they did it, they said, we're going to take a quota. You can have as many people immigrating based on their percentage in the population in 1890. And most of these people came after then, right? Most, right? There was one point at which half of Americans, these people came through Ellis Island, right? Where half of Americans either came from Ellis Island or were descended from people who came through Ellis Island, from that massive immigration. How many people here are from that descended from people who came there? People who came from, no, not too many, huh? No kidding. Came from Galveston. 
right, or, or, or came to Galveston or other places. From that immigration, a lot of them went to Galveston. Too. How many people are descended from that immigration? Gee, not too many. How many people? Italian Americans, Polish Americans. Not too many. Well, if you go to the Northeast, half the class would raise its hand. Maybe a little less now. Maybe a little less. If you go to the Midwest, maybe half or a little less now because of immigrations from, from uh, Latin America and uh, some from Asia. But it's a lot of people. In 1924, the scientific, and I put that in big quotes, testimony before Congress that was used to shut it down was, we have given IQ tests to these people and they are innately inferior intellectually. They are watering down. And if they start to intermarry with the rest of us, they are watering down the innate intellectual capacity of this country. And most of the people who were tested, it was in the 70s and above were retarded. 70 something percent of the Poles, something percent of the Italians and the Jews and these. Uh, there was one group, I can't remember which one it was, at 68. They were massively retarded based on these tests. Never mind the fact that the overwhelming majority of students in the Northeast and Northern Midwest who were in the public universities, the cheap of the free public universities, were from these ethnic groups. Never mind that. Okay? Didn't matter. Never mind that when they went to school, right, they were doing. Meanwhile, the parent, by the way, these immigrations were just mired in poverty. These were the people who were just extraordinarily poor, right? If you had, were doing nicely in, in Italy, you didn't come. If you were doing nicely in Poland, you didn't come. There was actually a sense about what percentage of the people who came from Poland in Poland, because the Tsar did a census in the eight, late 1890s and so did the United States. About 25% of the people in Poland were considered middle class. They were middle class business, entrepreneurs, that kind of thing. Right? Of the Polish Poles who immigrated here, 2% had done that when they were in Poland. These were people mired in poverty, mired in poverty. My mother actually was in that immigration, right? She came right at the end. She just made it in. Okay? And she tells a story of the overwhelming poverty in Russia, and that happened, right? And people were just, most of the people, there were some political refugees, but most of the people were dirt poor, right? They weren't very well educated. If they were well educated, like my grandfather, my mother's mother, my, my mother's mother was well educated. My father's parents, nah, they could read, but, they, but he, he didn't know English. How was he going to learn English? Sitting in the middle of white Russia, you know, he didn't know English. So, and the tests were given. So, these tests have been used forever to prove the innate inferiority of certain, of, of certain groups. Lately, it's been blacks they've been picking on. Interestingly enough, they started to use to pick on, on some of the immigrants from, from Latin America, but there was a tremendous reaction against it. So, but to this day, you'll hear it. Now, it is, now, I'm just going to give you Lieberman's theory about, uh, so, right? If you were to go in the 70s and 80s and give this test to black and white kids, right, the black kids would do worse than the white kids, uh, right? It's almost standard deviation below. So some people said, hey, wait a minute. What about socioeconomic status? What about poverty? We know that poor kids do lousy, and there are many more black kids who are poor than white kids in the schooling, etc. So they said, okay, we'll do it by class. And as you went up socioeconomic class, right, the gap narrowed, but it, there, it was still a gap. Well, I shut my big mouth off, and I said, just wait a minute. Socioeconomic status, you've all heard that, right? But it's like IQ. It's a hodgepodge of this and that. It, so, for instance, at that time, teacher salaries put them in the lower class. Most people had six classes, lower, lower class, upper, lower class, lower, middle class, upper, lower class, lower, upper class, upper, upper class, all right? Put teachers in the upper, lower class. But since they all had college degrees, so it pushed them up to the middle class. And it was, so it's a little of this and a little of that. And generally what tends to happen is people come into the middle class economically when they come to America, right? And then their offspring, their children, tend to come in educationally. So, uh, for instance, I'll give, you, I'll give you an extreme example. And I'm going to get disappointed again because you're, you're all going to be culturally deprived. Who knows who Sonny Liston was? Is What was he famous for? Sonny Liston. I knew it. I knew nobody would know. Oh, thank God. Go ahead. 
Wasn't he a boxer? He was, say it louder. He is a boxer. A boxer, but not just a boxer. Go ahead. He was the world champion who got knocked out by Cassius Clay before right. he became Muhammad He was the person whom Cassius Clay, later to be known as Muhammad Ali, beat for the world title. By the way, Clay was, Liston was favored 15 to 1 over Clay. I took a look at that guy's eyes, Clay. He's up there. He's moving. He's grooving. I could see the. He's making. I said he's gonna kill him. I bet five dollars, a dollar, and I gave him only. I said fifteen. I'll give you ten to one odds, and I won. I had fifty bucks. Fifty bucks in those days was a lot of money. College tuition was fifty bucks a semester in public universities. I had my pocket money for the whole damn semester, 50. Well, it was a day you go in and get a cup of coffee and a piece of cake, cost you 75 cents. Long time ago, <laughs> it was in the 60s, in the 60s. A lot, what? 64, 64, that's right, when I was in college. Right, 64, good. And then they had another fight and Clay beat him again, and then Clay, but I was always a Muhammad Ali fan because he made me that 50 bucks, right? Liston could not read and write. But in case you haven't noticed, even in those days, he got paid a couple of million per fight. Well, a guy who's getting paid a couple of million per fight is not in the lower class. He's filthy rich, right? He was rich. And I think he had a manager who managed it okay for him. He stayed rich, right? So he's in the upper class by money. But as I, so you understand what I'm saying? It's a, a, a little of this and that. What you say, it, it, this is not exactly correct, but if you start from the 1950s with Brown versus the Board of Education, later the Civil Rights Movement, et cetera, et cetera, and the movement of a lot of blacks from the South to the North, et cetera, and you look at that as that's like an immigrant population. It's not a very good parallel. It's got a lot of problems. There were a lot of blacks who were doing well in America before that, and there was still tremendous prejudice, but jobs began to open. You saw the typical kinds of things. So the typical kinds of thing, ways that people, for instance, sports opened. Okay, well, blacks were able to get into sports. In case you haven't noticed, for a long time, when the Italians came, they dominated boxing. Rocky Marziano and Rocky Graziano and this and that. There were a lot of Jews who were in boxing. Surprise people? Every championship, except there was never a Jewish heavyweight championship, but Slapsy Maxie Rosenbaum and Benny Leonard and Barney Ross, a lot of them, and then they, that was typical. You'll notice, by the way, now how you're seeing that blacks, there are less blacks in, in sport, in professional sports and more Hispanics, because that's the way people are, that's one of the typical ways, because you have to be good. Civil service jobs, all the Irish cops, right, and that kind of stuff, that's typical. Okay, civil service jobs, you begin to see that also in the black community, right? Opening up small businesses. But then you begin to get this thing, maybe I didn't go to college, I heard this from my parents, but you're going. I had a friend of mine, his father, he had a small business, and he, he was a great baseball player. We used to have a rule. If he could hit the ball to the, the softball to the top of the fence and it rolled down to the dining hall, it was an automatic home run. Steve used to hit him over the dining hall. He was a great player. And he got a trial from the Cardinals to come to their, you know, trial camp. His father said to him, you'll never make the team. He said, how do you know? He said, how can you make the team with two broken arms? So said, what do you mean two broken arms? He said, if you don't go to college, I'm breaking both your arms. His father said, right? He said his father knew he was, he was okay, but he wasn't good enough to, I mean, he was good, but he wasn't going to make the pro. Go to college, go to college, go to college. Now, of course, people who have a job, I don't know, in the immigration department or in the post office or in the police, police department, right? They're middle class because they're making enough money, et cetera, et cetera, even if they didn't go to college. So what I said is what we need is a, way, a generation of black kids who went to college, or going to whose parents went to college, that you didn't have very much of that in the 50s. So when that happens, the IQ gap is going to go away. Gee, I hate to say I told you so. No, I don't. If you take those kinds of populations, there's no difference. There's no difference. And the other thing you have to ask yourself is, there are still cultural differences in America, not just white, black, Hispanic. That's just when we get to cover that. There are many, many different cultures involved in all those groups. Right? I'll tell you one more story. I'm in Israel, and one of these guys 
right after this article came out, I go to Israel. I was there for five years, studying for a master's degree. One of these guys comes, these Jensen guys, to prove the innate inferiority of one ethnic group over another. I'm on my soapbox now, can you tell? And he says, well, and he's proven this and then that. So one visiting professor, actually he eventually stayed in Israel because he raised his hand and he said, let me ask you a question. And he, right, and he was from the United States, so he knew this stuff. He said, on the average, this is Tel Aviv University, where 99 point something percent of the students are Jews, right? Maybe 98 point something percent. He said, let me ask you a question. On the average, Jews score higher on the verbal test. They're, the scores of Jews on the verbal part of the IQ is higher than the average. Would you say then that Jews ha are innately superior as a group for verbal abilities? The guy stops, he thinks, he obviously didn't know the statistics, although it happens to be more or less true, at least in those days it was. He said, yeah, I guess I'd have to say that. The whole place cracked up, right? I'm sitting, I'm a graduate student with all the faculty members began to laugh so hard. I mean, it, it was just, they were hysterical. Because every stupid answer they got came from somebody who was Jewish. You know, they got a normal distribution of grades. Everybody who failed a test was Jewish. Everybody who flunked out of college was Jewish. I mean, you know, it was just it was a ridiculous statement. Okay? Of course, what you have is a culture that, for various reasons, values verbal kinds of things. Aggression had to be verbal because physical aggression was impossible when you're being discriminated against, right? All kinds of things. It's a kind of the same thing. Does anybody think that, by the way, Chinese Americans tend to do better on, on, on math kinds of things? than the average. Anybody think there's a, that the Chinese have a gene for math? This is correlation. It's not causality. And to do that is absurd. Did I talk to you about basketball? And which ethnic group dominated basketball? I think I talked about that already. So you have to be very careful about this stuff. Very, very careful. In particular, when it should be obvious to you how much background, how much education, how much you know, influences these tests. People often ask me, well, it's the best thing we have. What are you going to do instead? I said, no, I say nothing. If you have something that's giving you misinformation, that's telling you something that's not true, why do you say, well, it's the best thing I have? Well, I have this, 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 this seasoning. It makes the food taste awful, but I don't have any other one. So put it in there. What are you doing? Okay, now we're going to go on to the next thing that these tests have done, standardized tests have done. Let's go to the overhead, the PowerPoint. Okay, Franz Kafka once said, the writer, just because your doctor has a name for your condition doesn't mean he knows what it is. Of course, this is his way of warning us about circular explanations. Okay, come back to me. We're going to start talking now about learning disabilities. Did I tell you a story about my aunt and uncle arguing on the porch? I don't think I did. Okay, at the time I lived in Israel, a lot of my family went to Israel. They ran away from the communists. Some came here and some went there and all kinds of things. So and <coughs> anyway, so the, the, there was a, a big family there. And we used to get together at the house of, my mother was one of eight children, the oldest sister's house, right? Because that's, if the parents died, that's where they got together. And, my, and her husband, who owned the house, right, with her, and another one of my mother's sister's aunts, one was, he was very right, in, right and she was very left-wing. It was in terms of Israeli politics, it was a little different, but you get the idea. Right-wing, left-wing. So we used to get together, don't say anything about politics. Talk about family, talk about this, right? Those of us, what letters did you get from the family in America? Da, da, da. Someone has a kid stunning in France. Just, then somebody, without thinking, said, oh, it's uh, 6 o'clock, let's turn on the news. On comes on a news item, but one of them made a crack, the other one starts, and they start to go at it. Yelling and screaming and this and that. Even me with my big mouth, and I knew people pretty well then, I got out of there. I ran out, I'm sitting on the porch. And I, I couldn't take it anymore. Even me, who loves to argue. And I'm reading the newspaper. So my uncle, who owned the house, 15 minutes later after this argument, he comes out and he's like this on the porch, storming up and bad. I'm off to the corner porch. I'm not going to say anything to him. Right? He's pacing the porch, pacing the porch like this. 
Finally, he turns around, he looks at me, he says, What are you reading that newspaper for? I don't read. This was an uncle who wrote books, right? He was a math teacher, he wrote books, he did this, this was that. So I looked at him, he said, You don't have to read books. You don't have to read newspapers. You don't have to listen to radio. You don't have to watch television. You don't have to do anything to know what to do, right? I'm reading it. I said, huh? He said, all you have to do is listen to your aunt. Do the opposite of what she says, and you'll always be right. So that's what I'm telling you. If you want to be a good scientist, look at learning disabilities and the whole area of learning disabilities and attention disability and all that. Do the opposite, and you'll be a pretty good scientist. Just about every mistake you can make is there. Okay, let's go to learning disabilities. Learning disabilities are also a statistical construct, okay? A learning disability is determined by subtracting a person's score on a standardized achievement test from her or his score. I'm recording this as a his day, his score on an IQ test. Okay, now come back to me. Here's what it says. A learning disability is considered to be a, a, a large gap between your innate ability which is defined as, which is measured by an IQ test. People tell you that's innate ability. The IQ people won't quite say that, but it's used like that. And your achievement, okay? Okay, so let's go back here to the, the PowerPoint. If the difference between the IQ score and the standardized achievement score is greater than 15, 15 points, one standard deviation, you got it? The person is considered to be learning disabled. So let's take two people. Student A has an IQ of 100. And on a standardized achievement test, it's an 86. 14, not LD. Person B has an IQ of 101. Gets an 85 on the standardized achievement test. Difference is 16, LD. Now, if this doesn't strike you as ludicrous, you ought to, th you ought to uh, think about it again. So person A is, I don't know, just not achieving up to... Snuff. Come back to me. Person B, oh, neurological problems, oh, learning disability, oh, all the stuff kicks in. By the way, if you want to get unlearning disabled, just blow a couple of questions on the IQ test next time. Then your IQ will be 97, <laughs> right? Okay. That's how it's defined. It's a statistical construct. Now, we're told, I don't, I don't have the, defin the federal definition here, it keeps changing, but basically we're told a learning disability is something wrong in one of the basic psychological processes of the child. But we're never told what those basic psychological processes are. Okay? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. If the number we get from this subtraction exercise is greater than 15, then we get this whole host of circular explanations, unsubstantiated contentions about genetic damage, in order to explain why the child cannot learn what we are teaching. Between circular explanations and making contentions without any evidence, we're in great shape. Okay? Now, can you get my picture in the corner there? Is that possible? Okay. Wait a minute. Okay, so we use a bunch of circular terms that are used in schools that they don't know why a child can perform a task. They're simply comp describe what the child can't do in fancy words. Dyslexia, trouble reading disease. That's what it means. Dyscalculia, you heard of this one? Trouble calculating disease. Dysgraphia, trouble writing disease. Graphics, graphics etc. Make up your own, you could become famous. <laughs> you, you think I'm laughing? Come back to me. One day I'm reading an article. Said these kids, kids who don't get along with other kids on the playground are suffering from dysemia. Huh? Well, the word semia comes from the Greek word for a sign. They don't pick up social signs from other kids. You have a kid can't blow it. <coughs> you know, there's some kids who have trouble blowing their nose. You know what I'm talking about? If you've ever had kids, you know that. They can't blow their nose. They have dysblosia. Now, if we were to take the word blow and translate it to Latin or Greek, it would sound like something. 
this that you, this that you, make it up. Whatever the kid can't do, say it's this, right? We talked about the word hirsute, didn't we? Right, I'm looking at a man, he has, uh, uh, he has a hirsute deficiency syndrome. Right? That's why he's bald. I didn't say your name, so it's all right. Okay? The guy in back of him has it even worse. Oh, boy. Right? This hurts you? I mean, make it up! Okay. Let's go back here. Describing the symptoms of a disease, no matter how accurate, do not constitute a diagnosis. The second person is looking at the first one to see if he's really more bald or not, right? If I go and I take every man in this room, okay, because this is male dyshertia, this is male dyshertia syndrome, right? And I count the hairs on everyone's head, right? Have we got a receding hairline? Oh, there's one over there. Ah, you're hiding it, but I can see it, right? <coughs> okay, and I count the hairs on everyone's head, and I range them from my dyshertia, dyshertia score, or male, male hirsute deficiency syndrome is, I don't know, 98. I got most of my hair. This is 86. Here's 100. Another 100. All you guys are young. Just wait. Okay? And then I get here. I get a 26. And over there I get a 15. Right? Nothing personal, right? <laughs> it still doesn't tell me why they're going bald. And by the way, there are a lot of reasons to go bald. I actually started to go bald back here when I was a kid. Right? There's a thing called alopecia. I don't know if anybody has it. It's common. I bet there's some people in this room who have had alopecia. Yeah, it just, all of a sudden, you get bald spots. If you've ever seen people, it's often young people, their, their hair is in clumps, that's alopecia. They're not sure what that comes from either, but they're pretty sure it has something with circulatory stuff to them, because it usually goes away when you get older. There are all kinds of reasons to lose your hair, right? Mostly it's male pattern baldness, right? right? The only way to check if that's the reason, never mind. If you castrate a person, the hair will grow back, so that's because the testosterone's gone, but that's, that's why women tend to, to start to bald when they get older. Because the balance between the estrogen and testosterone, the testosterone gets up there and some can lose their hair, okay? Okay, let's go back here. Standardized tests, both IQ and achievement tests, describe what a child can and cannot do. They describe symptoms, if you will. Although, for one short time, they don't tell why the child is performing as he or she is thus, they're not diagnostic. Okay, they're descriptive. Come back to me, I'm going to say this. I just don't have the guts to write it down yet. You know the schools, the diagnosticians, the one who give the, the course? The, they're not diagnosticians. They're labelicians. They give labels. I, I, I see somebody going like this. You're starting to be a diagnostician, right? No, no, no. <laughs> your mom, she said, oh, her mom is. They do, was your mom a teacher for years first? Right. Interestingly enough, so the recommendations that come from the diagnosticians have nothing to do with what's on the test. If I go, here, here's my kid. Come over here, kid. <laughs> I knew his name. I forgot again. Tell me your name. I'm here, right? Everybody knows except me. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Amir's seven and a half years old. <laughs> I'm his second grade teacher, and he can't read at all. So we sent him in for testing. I'm the second grade teacher. Tell me your name. Colleen. Colleen, stand next to him. Let me get my junk out of the way. Seven and a half years old, can't read at all, very poorly. And let's try one more. These are the three kids who are driving me nuts in my class. They're nice kids, but they can't read. And? Oscar. Oscar. That's next for my kid. First an Emmy, then an Oscar. Okay? <laughs> all right? Can't read at all. So I go in and I test them here. IQ, 103. Standardized testing, 80. 
What's the diagnosis? LD. LD. Test Colleen. IQ 68. Let's make it 66. Yes. Standardized test, 67. What's wrong with her? <coughs> What's wrong with her? IQ 66? Go ahead, say it. Oh, yeah, there's something. Well, according to the diagnostician, what's wrong with her? She's retarded. Okay? And now we have Oscar. IQ, nine, uh, IQ 87, standardized test 80. What's wrong with him? He's just a little stupid, right? Slow learner, right? We don't say a little stupid anymore, but... He, he, If his IQ were 95 and his achievement or were 94 and his achievement was 80, he doesn't quite hit ID. We'll say, well, he needs some special attention. We need to get him up to, we need to encourage him, but we can't, I can't stick the label on him. Notice, nobody, no matter what's wrong, the blame is on the kid. No one has dyskulia. No one has dystestia, dysbureaucratia. The bureaucrats don't know what they're up to. No one has this curriculumia, where the curriculum is not appropriate. It's all rigged so it's the kid's fault. And by the way, let me have one more person. All right, name? Sam. Sam. Sam has an IQ of 84, 83, and his, his achievement is 80 is 80, is a standardized achievement test is 80, he's just slow. He's a slow kid, right? So here are my four seven and a half year olds. No matter what's wrong, there's something wrong with them. Nobody ever says, you screwed up your teaching. Don't you have to examine? This means I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, the way I'm gonna do it, and if, something, if something goes wrong, it's your fault, kid. It's your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. Right? Something wrong with you. All right, give me all a big hand. Thank you very much. All right. There are people taking this class who had labels stuck on them. I know it. Now, I'm not going to ask you. Now, the problem is, wait, come back here, Amir. Where'd you go? After I'm told, oh, you know why Amir can't read? He has dyslexia, which means he has trouble reading. I know he has dyslexia. I send him to come and say he has trouble reading why to say he has trouble reading disease, but wait, I'll translate it into, into Latin. That doesn't tell me what to do. And the recommendations the diagnosticians make up have nothing to do with the test. From my experience is, the longer the diagnostician was a teacher, the better off, or a speech pathologist, or uh, whatever, the better off you are, right? The more experience they have with kids. They don't even need the tests, by the way. Now, so if they're not, okay? All right, I'm here. You can sit down now for a while. Thank you. Okay, so the question then becomes, okay, these tests are descriptive. They don't tell me what, what to do. Don't go to the PowerPoint yet, okay? Now, what ha so what happens is we have a meeting here. Let's go to the, to the uh, overhead something that's called an ARD meeting. Most of you are familiar with these. Okay, ARD stands for admission into, admission into, referral within, right, and dismissal from special ed. And each kid has to have an IEP, an individualized educational program. In many states, these are called, whoops, sorry. In many states, these are called IEP meetings. Okay? Not ARD meetings. Okay, now come back to me. Okay, now I'm going to ask you, who's ever been to an ARD meeting? Oh, man, we got a ton of people. Who went to the ARD meeting as a teacher? Who has more say? You or the diagnostician? With the numbers. Usually. What? You never had a diagnostician in your meeting? You have to. Push that down. 
How can you put a kid into special ed without test results? Uh, we have a case manager that's in there, but the diagnostician has never been in our meeting that I've been to. Oh, who has more say? You or the case manager? Case manager. Right. So the people, the case manager usually has the diagnostician's results, right? It's a, the person who has never seen the kid before and will never see the kid again has much more say than the teacher is with the kid all the time. In general, the closer you are to the kid, the better you know the kid, the less say you have. So the parents have almost no say. Usually what they try to do is blind the parents with science. Run over them with all these fancy terms. Oh, your kid has an auditory processing problem. What does that mean? Well, okay. let me tell you how I got on to Okay, never mind. Oh, your kid has a visual this, or your kid has just this and just that and just the other thing. I'll tell you in a second how I got on to this. Then the teachers have the next less say. Then usually the principal the next less say. And as it goes up, right, and finally some people who are, you know, managers, uh, etc., they have all the say. Almost every term that is used is, is circular. I'll tell you how I got onto this. I'm teaching a doctoral class years ago. And somebody did a paper on this stuff, and I didn't know. I didn't know much about it, right? I, she said, well, the kid has an auditory processing problem. So in all innocence, I wasn't being a wise guy the way I usually am. I said, well, can you explain what the process is and where it's breaking down? I expected some sort of a, a you know, a, a theoretical description of how verbal information is turned into understanding and how it was breaking down. Like, what, something. So she says, well, 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 it, it, the, 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 it, the information comes in, but the kid's brain can't understand it. It doesn't register in the brain. There's something wrong in the brain. So I said again, very innocently, <laughs> how do you know? And I expected her to pull out, you know, information from CAT scans and uh, uh, EEGs. Is that right? Yeah, EEGs and PET scans. And the PET scan is just being invented in those days. She says, well, blah, 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 that's the answer. So if, the, if you show the kid something, the kid can't do it. So oh, it's a visual processing problem. If you tell the kid something, the kid doesn't understand. Oh, it's an auditory processing problem. Right? The kid has an auditory... Your kid can't understand when you talk because the kid has an auditory processing problem. How do you know that's what's wrong? Because the kid couldn't understand. Classic circular explanations over and over again. Okay? And then, so, let's go to the PowerPoint again. Vast amounts of time and money are spent labeling children. But after we have the labels, we don't know anything more about how to teach the kid than we did before the testing. When I come back, come back to me for a second, and somebody tells me, Amir has dyslexia. So, what do I know that I didn't know before? Nothing. Right? And let's go back here. When we don't know what's wrong, we don't know what to do. The recommendations made by diagnosticians are not based on any understanding of the kid's thinking, learning strategies, etc., because the tests don't provide any information like that. Okay, now let me tell you, come back to me. Now, let me tell you something that I have had a lot of conscientious teachers tell me. Good teachers, right? There's some of you here now. Who is saying in the back of your mind, yeah, you may be right, but I've got to do something to get the kid help? I'll send a kid for testing to get help. See, see, there, there, your teacher, teacher, yeah, yeah. The problem is, how do you know what's going to help? Suppose I tell you, you said this, this diagnostician has three recommendations. The third recommendation dooms the kid to permanent illiteracy. It's the worst thing you could do. How do you know I'm wrong? It's like going to a doctor and saying, listen, I've got to get a diagnosis so I can start stuffing you full of pills. Of course, the fourth pill may kill you or make you worse. When you start doing stuff, and usually it's stuff that's already been done, the kid didn't learn anyway. 
How do you know? I'll give you a little example. If you have a kid who has dyscalculia in the first grade, and the kid doesn't know he can't do math, the first thing I'm going to do is test the kid's conceptions of number. And it's normal for a sixth grader, for a six-year-old, especially one who's from poverty circumstances or for a five-year-old, to think there are more fingers on this hand than on this hand, and then to think there are more fingers on this hand than on this hand. If you start drilling that kid on math, it is the worst thing that you can do. If you try to start to explain number concepts to a kid who doesn't fundamentally understand what a number is, it's the worst thing that you can do, from my theoretical perspective. Okay, because, let's go back to the PowerPoint, all we have for diseases are all the fancy names that we have for the diseases are circular explanations. Circular explanations that give fancy sounding names to a disease but do not constitute a diagnosis. They don't identify an etiology for the supposed diseases they describe. Look, let me come back to me. You know what etiology is? Etiology means the underlying cause. Okay? I go to the doctor, I know what happens. You go to the doctor, you have a fever, your nose is running, you're sweating, you feel like a truck just sideswipe you, and you pray that the etiology is bacterial, right? Please make it a strep infection so he can give me some antibiotics. Then nine times out of ten, he said, sorry, it's a virus, just suffer. Here, here's something, here's a decongestion, here's a throat loss, here's a this and here's a that. So symptoms get a little better and now you still feel like a truck just sideswipe you, right? But he's looking for the etiology. Is it viral? Is it bacterial? Once I went with one of those things, except I didn't have a fever, so I knew what he'd say. And he said to me, I think this is an allergy. I said, yeah, please. I haven't had an allergy since I was 15. He said, I came down here to the pollen capital of the world. I said, I have an allergy. He said, I'm telling you, it's an allergic reaction. Just like, remember the story about my skin, right? I said, all right, wise guy. I said, but I'm, uh, antihistamines, if you, you, you notice I, I'm saying the word antihistamine twice, I have this urge to go to sleep. How many people, you look at an antihistamine and you fall asleep for 10 hours? Oh, man. He said, I have to give you an antihistamine if we're going to get rid of this. And I was suffering in my nose and I fell So fortunately, I didn't have a class the next day. Called up, canceled the meetings. I took the antihistamine and went to sleep for 20 hours. I got back up. I was fine. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. He was right. Because he had the right etiology of what was wrong. Right? He knew what was wrong. Okay? And once you begin concocting reasons, anything goes. Anything goes. Science doesn't require absolute agreement, but it requires some sort of... Let me give you an example. There are three theories of where petroleum comes from, okay? Most of you are familiar with the fossil theory, that it's dead fossils, right? But there's one person, I think his name was Gold, I can't remember. It was an article in The Atlantic about 10 years ago, maybe more, where the guy said, I don't think so. He said, I think the major source of petroleum in the world is is methane gas, right? Carbon-based gas, but coming up from the center of the earth because the core is hot, and then it gets, it's coming up, and there's more gas behind it, pushing on it, pressuring it. All of a sudden it gets caught in cracks in the earth, right? And there's tremendous pressure on it, and that pressure turns it into petroleum. So the fossil fuel people said, oh, you're wrong. They went into the laboratory, they took organic material, they sort of fabricated what they considered the conditions on the earth at the time, and they got petroleum. This guy said, oh, watch. Took some gas, I can't remember, it was methane gas, some kind of gas, I think, comes up from the center of the earth, subjected tremendous pressure, he got petroleum. Maybe it was a combination, again, right? Maybe it was a combination of gases, got petroleum. 
And then he said, well, you know something? You know, you get petroleum at different layers. How do all the animals know to die at the same place? Of course, the answer back is, well, certain kinds of rocks hold petroleum, certain kinds don't. But you'll get wells that are absolutely pumped dry. Come back 25 years later, there's a little bit of petroleum back in them. Oil. He said, you see? And these, there, there were fights about this for quite a while. And it makes a difference, because if he's right, Petroleum is a renewable resource. At least all the gas runs out. When the earth gets that cold, we don't have to worry about it, right? Now there's a third theory. That's Lieberman's theory of the elves on the moon. The entire center of the moon is an ocean of petroleum. And on this, on this ocean of petroleum lives a, 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 a species of elves, teeny tiny little intelligent creatures. And for whatever reason, they like us. And so they periodically come and replenish the petroleum supplies, and here's how they do it. They take their teeny tiny spaceships, and they fill their spaceships with petroleum. Millions of them. Then they fly the spaceships down to Earth late at night, low under the radar, and their spaceships are, what do you call those toys you put them together? Transformers, right? So they take they take their spaceships and they put them together to make gigantic hypodermic needles. And then 10,000 elves hold each hypodermic needle and they take them and they go wham and they inject it into the soil. And that's where petroleum comes from. Who's ever been to a petroleum field? Anybody been to one? Are there holes in the ground? She said, yes, see, I told you. That's from the needles and the hypodermic needles that the elves put in there. You can always find evidence for, for theories. After you believe something, you can always find evidence to prove that it's true. Now, two of those explanations are good science, and one of them is really stinkeroo. Okay? You have to figure out which two are good, right? Okay? So just because people disagree, and scientists would laugh at my elves on the moon theory, obviously. Come on! You don't have any evidence for elves. You don't have evidence that the moon is full of petroleum. You know, come on, will you please? One little hole in the ground. That's your pretty ridiculous theory. But once we abandon science, anything goes when it comes to etiology. Okay, I want you to tell me explanations that you have heard for what causes learning disabilities or dyslexia or something. Tell me. Go ahead. Somebody tell me. Environmental stuff. Environmental stuff? Like what? Like family situations and stuff like that. Well, that's interesting. Because that means that it's, that's really? That you don't hear too much. That there's really nothing wrong with a kid. Just that he can't study or can't this or can't that. That's interesting. If those explanations are coming about, we're in a little bit better shape. At least we're giving the possibility. Go ahead. You Did you push a button down? Come over here. Push a button down. Yes. Oh, yeah. There you go. Genetics. Genetics. You've all heard that, right? Stay there. Stay there. We're, we're not finished yet. Okay? <laughs> genetics, right? Somehow it's in the gene. Well, if you're going to talk, genetics having to, having to do with some sort of innate, well, tell me your theory of genes and gene pools and how it relates. All right? Anybody heard anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Structural damage to the brain? Brain damage. Fine. Show me evidence. If you're going to tell me that he, Amir, can't read, or tell me your name? Yeah. Brandon can't read. I'm going to show you all these tricks when we get to information processing, but I remember stuff. I'm going to say, how come he doesn't do it himself? Why they can't read? Because of brain damage, so show it to me. I want PET scans, I want CAT scans, I want to see. Learning disability used to be called sometimes, here I'll show you on there, M MBI or MBD, minimal brain impairment or minimal brain damage. People say, well, where's your evidence? Either you have evidence of brain damage or you don't. And if you don't, putting the word minimal in front of it doesn't change the fact that you don't. So when people began to say, they said, okay, we'll call it LD, but they began treating it like that. 
what percentage of the kids who are labeled elder, you can see we don't check people's brains. If you're going to say people's brains are damaged, you've got to check their brains. Where's your evidence? Show me something. Interestingly enough, by the way, if anything can be found physically wrong with you, you're not LD. So if I find out you have a hearing impairment, then you go into hearing impaired. If I find out you have a, 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 some sort of uh, a visual impairment, you go into visual impaired. If I find out, for instance, that you're blacking out because you have frontal lobe seizures, right? Anybody see the uh, Michael Crichton's first book, The Andromeda Strain? What a dumb ending. But there was a, a, a woman there who was a scientist who certain light things would cause her to black out. If you have, you go, you go into here, come back to the overhead again, OHI, other health impaired. The minute I find something wrong with you, if I find you have frontal lobe seizures, for instance, you're other health impaired. You're not LD anymore. LD only means there's something wrong with you, and I have no idea what it is. Once you start this, let me give you some other. Anybody ever heard any other explanations? Go ahead. Prenatal stuff. Prenatal like stuff, mm -hmm. genetic stuff, right? Really? You got evidence? What is it that does it prenatally? What is it? Let me give you some other stuff. I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Fluorescent lights cause it. I, I, you heard that one? What? Well, well, push it down, push it down. You have to adjust the lighting for one of the students. They can't have like direct light coming on to their papers, and so they have to be, you know, they have a special seat for them with like a light that's above just for them to complete assignments. Had an art meeting too, and I wasn't aware of that, so. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Chiropractors adjusting scalp bones, I swear. Anti-dizziness medicine. The Orton Society, which is a society for dyslexia kind of thing, was named after a guy named Orton who said it has to do with, opposite, with, brain, with balance in your brain, right? I've been kicked out of a few meetings and nearly killed. This is one where I was kicked out of. In other words, and they have kids walking boards, right? You get on a board like this, right? On a two by four, and the kid is walking to get to his day, yeah, to get his balance. It's the lack of balance, motor coordination balance. Has anyone ever heard that? That contributes to this. So I got up and I said, you know, I have a friend whose daughter has a spina bifida. She's paralyzed from here down. She never walked anywhere. She can read just fine. She's an honor student. Who people got mad at me. Tracking. This is the one where I almost got kicked. I, I was almost literally thrown out of the school of optometry. This was the one based on tracking. If you take a light that goes boop, 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 right? It's, it's an oscilloscope, and it's going boop, boop across the screen. OK, most kids will look from left to right. They'll look to their left. This is my left over here. I know it's hard to do it. They'll go boop, look like this, boop, and they'll go back like this, boop, boop. They're looking for boop. They go back, boop. They're following it when it goes from left to right. About 10% of the kids go from right to left. They'll track like this, boop, and they follow it right to left, boop. So the guy gets up and he says, um, well, he says, those are the temper kind of the kids who are labeled dyslexic, the ones who track the wrong way. They can't really lift the right. So I raised my hand, said yes. I said, you know, I taught in Israel for several years. Hebrews went from right to left. I didn't notice that 90% of the kids were dyslexic. Are you going to tell me that of the, all the people who read Arabic, all the kids in those schools who are Arabic, where it goes from right to left, that they're all dyslexic? You have 90% dyslexia? Or does something happen in their brain that all of a sudden they track right to left? So I don't get it. How come all the languages that I read right to left, you don't have a 90% dyslexia rate? He got so angry with me, he wanted to kill me, I could tell. <laughs> and I said, you need to do some rethinking. And I walked out because I didn't want to be hit out over the head with a chair. I, kind of feel, I mean, please. Think about what you're saying. Putting red paper, putting red paper 
I'm not lying to you. Read through red paper. There was one guy, who was a sheet of paper to lend me? This one you're not going to believe. It's going to be destroyed, right? Here's what you do. Thank you. You take a hole, and you poke a hole in the middle of the paper. I'm not lying about this. This was a journal of medicine. You poke a hole in the paper, and you, how close can you get to me? Yeah. And you write around the, thanks. And you write around, the, and the kid reads around the edge of the hole. This is the kid who doesn't. What does this do? What? Makes him read better, supposedly. Different colored glasses. Smoke, and you, they give you a test. Well, you need a smoky gray, and you need a rose tinge, and you need a this, and you need a that. And by the way, there's some success. All these programs have some success. Okay. Yeah. Push it down, push it down, push it down. I don't have one. That's what I was going to walk to one. All right. Um, but, uh, Wait a second. Here. Give it to him there. Okay. Um, don't sit back there. What's the matter? I'm a nice guy. You can sit up here. <laughs> um, so, so the reading is not, when we say someone is slow, that's not a, a right, that's not a right term for what they don't read, right? Well, it depends. I mean, if they have a, if they have an IQ that's 87, 88, I mean, I don't know. That's right. It's not, it doesn't explain why. It doesn't explain why. Where, what was I talking about here about? Uh... Oh, yeah, the color line, right? Oh. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a little bet now. People out there have to do it, right? Here is my reading program. I'm going to take the bottom 2% of the people who are reading, okay? Bottom 2% of people in the reading, okay? And here is, my, here is my remediation program for them. Without telling them or the teacher, I'm going to eat alphabet soup every day, okay? I'm going to spell out their names in the alphabet soup. Fred Reed. Then I eat it. Doris Reed, then I eat it. Amir Reed, and then I eat it. Who else couldn't read? Oscar Reed, and then I ate it. Colleen Reed, and then I ate it, right? Also, I take their names, okay? I put it between a book at night. You know, I've got the bottom 2%, you know, a lot of kids. I put their name between the cover of a book. I put it under my pillow. And as I fall asleep, I say, read, 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 read. And then during lunch, I take my car. I drive it around the school. They can't see me because they're all in the lunchroom. And I say their names. Read, read, read. And then I'm going to retest them and see how they do. Compared. I don't expect them to become wonderful, but I expect some improvement with this program. Who thinks it's going to work? Two. Who thinks it's not? You have to vote. Who's going to put your money where your mouth is? Uh, I'm ready to, okay, I'll give you 10 to 1 odds. $10, 100 against 10. If all of you who voted no, give, give me 10 bucks, that'll be enough for a trip to Vegas. Go ahead, you don't think it's going to work? Can you clarify something then? Yeah. If are you telling these people that you're doing this? No, this is a nope. Nobody knows but nope. me. Nobody knows but me. But okay. wait, 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 push it down, push it down. Better? Wait, wait, wait. Oscar, test wait. better when you give them the test again? No, no, no. Okay. You're right. Obviously, they're doing the regular. You said, isn't it going to be better when you give them the test again? Except, I'm going to, again, I'm going to give the whole school the test. And I'm going to tell you they're not going to be the bottom 2% anymore. Right after six months, I'm going to give the whole school the test, and they're going to move up slightly. Not great, but slightly. How can you, but how can you attribute their success to your driving around the school? I didn't ask you for a trip. I just wanted to know if it was, if, if they were going to get better. And you all owe me, tell me, you all owe me 10 bucks. And the people at home, I know how you voted, send in the money. <laughs> it's going to work. A little bit. Does anybody know why? By the way, never, 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 ever do it with a top 2% because it'll make things worse. Does anybody know why it works? Go ahead. 
Who's a statistics teacher? Go ahead. Yeah, there are so many other reasons why. But well, why am I sure that it's going to get better? Because every time you take a test, your scores, I guess it's a statistic thing. It's just going to be different. You're going to answer some more correct, more, some incorrect. It's just going to, I don't know. It's you're right. variable. I don't She's know how to say this it. This close to I the right answer. <laughs> Regression, you know the term? Push it to say it. Regression toward the mean. Regression toward the mean. Look, let's go to the overhead. This is the bottom 2%. They did rotten on this test, okay? Now, no test is perfect. No test is perfect. Okay? So come back to me for a second, if you can. No test is perfect. Right? Sometimes they have a good day, sometimes they have a bad day, good guesses, bad guesses. How many times did you ever pass a test by the skin of your teeth you didn't know one word that was on it? Just dumb luck, you guessed right. Right? And then sometimes you get a bad test, you got a seven day, you say, oh, I knew this, oh, I knew that. You just have a bad day, you're upset, you're this, you're that. Now, do you think the people, let's go back to the overhead, down here, do you think this is, that this test, that there, so tests either, can either, oh, that's, that's called, it's, a, it's an error of measurement, there's a measurement error. Do you think these people's scores are underestimated or overestimated? What? Obviously, more people here have underestimates than overestimates, right? The people who had the bad luck guessing day, the people who didn't feel good that day, the people didn't, etc., etc. They're all down here, right? These are the people. So if you retest them, their scores are going to go slightly like this. Likewise here. These are the people who had a good luck day. We're feeling great, right? When you retest, the people at the extremes tend to go to, this is called regression. toward the mean. Right, the lower scores regress toward the mean. They tend to do that, right? If you just retest these people. Come back to me. That's why every single remediate pro re remedi remedial reading program works. A little bit. You're taking the worst of the worst, you're retesting them again, oh, a little better. I think there have been one or two in history that haven't. Right, and they were really ridiculous. So, that's the problem. All of these things, you go to people who do these things, and some kids improve a little bit. Besides, some of you said, well, wait a minute, I've got to clarify this. Aren't they going to just be learning to read better anyway a little bit? So they improve a little bit also from what they're learning in class. Okay. But what we have... Let's go back to the PowerPoint. What we have here is a situation where all failures are blamed on the child. And we, mainta we maintain without having any evidence to substantiate our claim that something must be, wait a minute, just stay there. I'll fix this up one of these days. What is this called? Earn while you learn? There we go. Here we go. Wait, we're going to go right back. Wait, let me save this first. <coughs> See, I'm giving you a PowerPoint lesson here. No charge. There we go. We maintain we'll have any evidence to substantiate our claim that something must be wrong with a student, usually in a sensory modality. That's why he or she is not achieving. Okay, come back to me. We're going to have another little vote here. I have news for you people. I do, this is my hobby, okay? I'm so rich. I won the Texas lottery, what was top, the Powerball lottery, the Irish sweepstakes, and several other lotteries. I had a guy who invested my money in some crazy stock, and I quadrupled it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have billions and billions and billions of dollars. I make Bill Gates look like what he has is chump change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this money and I'm going to invest it in any program, anything that's even slightly reasonable, trying to find out what is wrong with kids who have learning disabilities. So I'm going to look for neurological things, family things, right? Brain damage, genetics, want to do a genetic factor. What is wrong with these kids? How many think that what I'm doing 
is basically good science, and how many people think it's not basically good science? We're taking a vote, you have to vote. Who thinks it's, now obviously I'm going to invest in a lot of stuff that's, you know, a little oddball, but I don't care, I got so much money, I don't know what to do with it, right? Who thinks basically that what I'm doing is a pretty good approach to this? And who thinks it's no good? Who doesn't trust me? You know, who thinks it's no good? Why is it no good? Do we do this already? Why is it no good? It stinks! Why is it no good? Why is saying I'm going to invest all this money to find out what's wrong with these kids bad science? I don't have the program here, so I can't show you. Go ahead. You're starting out with the assumption that there's something wrong with them instead of actually figuring out what's wrong. Did you hear her? Say it louder. You're starting out with the assumption that something is wrong with them. That's right. I have a pre-drawn conclusion. Wonderful. Tell me your name. Jennifer. Jennifer gets an F for being a wise guy. Okay, that's exactly right. Jennifer caught it. I'm starting with a pre-drawn conclusion. Something's wrong with these kids. That's why I'm not saying, let me find out why they can't read. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, let's find out what's wrong with them. That's no good. Just imagine that you took your car and you went to the, you took it back to the dealer and you said, you know, every time I turn it, it wobbles. I can't make good turns. Oh, you have dystrivia. I put on the brakes and the car, the car screeches. You have dystrivia. Another symptom of dystrivia. It's not my fault, it's not my car. Suppose people said, look, we're paying billions of dollars to you, to the school system, to teach the kids. Kids with Down syndrome can learn how to read. You can't teach kids who have no evidence of brain damage how to read? What the hell is the matter with you? This is an incompetent school system. These kids have dyscolia. What is wrong with you? Let's look at the College of Education. What's wrong there? Let's look at the teacher. What's wrong there? Let's look at the curriculum. What's wrong there? Look at the grammar. Nothing wrong with the kids. It's your damn fault. You could broach it that way too, right? The kids have a schooling disability. Why not? Did you ever see the sign on the back of a car? If you can read this, thank a teacher. Did you ever see that bumper sticker? What about next to it? If your kid can't read this, blame a teacher. That one we don't see. And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. What is going on here? The lack of science is given away by this. There's a wire loose in the kid's brain. Who's heard that one? There's snow on the antenna. I heard that one from a psychiatrist and a damn good one too, by the way. When you start hearing stuff like that, it's because people don't know. There was someone who did a study who showed that boys' brains were 30%, 30% of them had didn't have this balance in the left and right, that there wasn't a, there's a, 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 a migration of neurons. And 30% of them didn't have an even migration of neurons. If 30% of your boys are abnormal, what is your definition of normal? Just to jump to the next topic a second. If 25% of the boys in your school are on Ritalin, maybe there's something wrong with your definition of what acceptable behavior is. 25% of your boys are abnormal. There's something wrong with your definition of abnormal. In some schools, it's even more. When we get back, I'm going to finish this. We're going to talk a little bit about attention deficit disorder. <coughs> Not even the decency to translate it into Latin, the circle explanation. And then we'll probably have time to go out to begin our next topic. Okay, I'll see you after the break.